Not that many weeks ago, I found myself on the phone with BYU's Advancement Vice President, Keith Vorkink. In that call, he invited me to give the devotional here today. This was a surprising, completely unexpected invitation, but I nonetheless agreed. After I got off the phone, still feeling a little bit out of sorts, I glanced down at my computer, planning to message my wife, Shannon, about this interesting development. The date on the calendar caught my eye, April 1st. Uh, perhaps this was some kind of elaborate April Fool's, Fool's joke. Uh, well, as you can see, I'm on the stage here this morning, so if it was, I'm not certain who got pranked. If you go to my BYU website to find out about what I do for research, here's what you'll read. A common theme in Woolly Lab research is the interrelationship between biological molecules and miniaturization. This is something we've actually been working on for quite a long time, as you can see from this digital adaptation of an overhead transparency that I used for a job talk that I gave at BYU back in 1999, which illustrated what my research focused on at that point. Um, and for context, overhead transparencies were the dominant technology for showing images in the classroom in the 1980s and 1990s. In simple terms, what my research focus means is that we make and use really small tools that chemists and other scientists, engineers, and maybe even doctors might care about. Now, with the right audience, and, and this one works, when presenting my research, I sometimes include the following scripture as justification for my scholarly pursuits. So, Alma chapter 37, verse 6, by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. Now, you of course know that this verse is about how the preservation of a scriptural record helped to move forward God's work. But the more literal attempted humor misinterpretation of that scripture that I use in the research context is that my pursuit of miniaturization can also lead to great things. Humor aside though, this introduces me to the premise of my remarks today that there can and should be bi-directional connections between my scholarship and faith. And this is at the core of the aims of a BYU education, which state the following. BYU seeks to develop students of faith, character, and intellect who have the desire and skills to continue learning and to serve others throughout their lives. These are the common aims of all education at BYU both those who teach in the classroom and those who direct activities outside the classroom are responsible for contributing to this educational vision. A BYU education, education should be one, spiritually strengthening, two, intellectually enlarging, three, character building, leading to four, lifelong learning and service. This connection between scholarship and faith is especially clear in the first two aims, spiritually strengthening and intellectually enlarging. Now, in the world, these two concepts are often thought to be at odds, but it is my experience that they may exist in harmony. And so, over the next 20 minutes, I plan to elaborate on three eternal spiritual principles that I have seen reinforced through my experiences as a faculty member scientist at BYU. Number one, advancing through continued imperfect effort, or repentance and Christ's atonement. Number two, careful, proactive attention to detail, or the wise use of agency. And then three, we are neither confined nor defined by our present circumstances, or making weak things become strong. So for most of my career, I've carried out research using microfluidics. Our microfluidic devices are designed miniature liquid-carrying structures that can be used on very small samples to speed up chemical processes or detect molecules indicative of human health. Now, during the past decade, I have been collaborating with Professor Greg Nordeen, who's an engineer here at BYU, to develop better ways to make and use microfluidics. Our approach involves 3D printing, and Greg and his students have designed and created 3D printers that make this possible. A key enabling feature of 3D printed microfluidics is the ability to significantly reduce the time spent in repeated 
cycles of designing, testing, and refining to improve microfluidic devices. And just as an example, I share here a slide that I used in a research presentation uh, last year to illustrate this point. So the power of our 3D printing approach is that we can start with a digital design file. For example, this is used for serial dilution, which is a common biochemical process. We can then rapidly 3D print a device and then evaluate the device experimentally. And then from those initial results, we can refine the design, create new 3D prints, and then carry out further experiments that advance the field. Let's break down this idea a little further now, though. We intentionally design and carry out experiments that we know will have a low likelihood of success. On the surface, that doesn't sound like a recipe for progress. In fact, it sounds like a great way to pursue failure. However, what makes our approach powerful is that we learn from each experiment, improving subsequent studies that build on those failures to move forward a little bit with each successive experiment and eventually create better systems. This concept of gradual improvement by learning from mistakes and failures is both positive and powerful as it can facilitate growth. I think all of us have experience in attempting to do something many times and failing, but slowly getting closer to the goal and then eventually succeeding. This principle is general and applies in various aspects of life. However, we can further view advancement through continued imperfect effort through the eye of faith. We all make mistakes. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. On our own, we can try to do better after each error, and we can improve. But how, for example, can we heal physical, spiritual, or emotional harm that we may have caused in ourselves or in another person through our mistakes? Is it possible to get a redo? Now, in my general chemistry classes, I actually allow the equivalent of a redo by replacing the lowest midterm exam score with the weighted average of the other midterms in the final exam. Yet, um, for most mistakes, and particularly for ones that inflict the deepest hurt, Life has no equivalent redo option. However, through the grace and atonement of Jesus Christ, all our mistakes may be corrected. It is possible for every human to repent, to change as President Russell M. Nelson has so ably taught. When we repent and turn to the Savior, the consequences of our mistakes are taken by him who surely hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, allowing both us and whomever we may have hurt to become whole again. I am grateful for the amazing grace of Jesus Christ for saving a wretch like me and allowing me to become better through continued imperfect effort. And I'm likewise thankful to have received a greater understanding of eternal truths regarding repentance and Christ's atonement through my scholarly endeavors as desired in the first two aims of a BYU education, spiritually strengthening and intellectually enlarging. Now, as a further example this, of this, let's talk about another eternal principle, the wise use of agency, and how this principle has helped in teaching one of my classes. The field, or my field of expertise, is analytical chemistry, and it is a very precise discipline. Over 100 years ago, the first American to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry, Theodore William Richards, was an analytical chemist. Dr. Richards was recognized for very precisely determining the masses of elements in chemistry's periodic table with about one part per million precision. That's equivalent to knowing the distance from here to a specific location in Southern California to within one yard and in the pre-GPS and pre-computer era. It's pretty amazing. So one of my favorite classes to teach is Chem 227, especially because it's the introduction to my discipline of analytical chemistry. I also love this class because I get to spend six hours a week in the lab with the students helping them learn about chemical analysis. However, the first time I taught Chem 227 as a brand new faculty member was not my finest moment as a teacher. 
I am really thankful that this was way before Rate My Professor was a thing. So the brutally honest feedback that I got from the students uh, didn't make it into the digital era. So one, one of my greatest challenges was in communicating to students how to become effective laboratory scientists. Chem 227 requires careful planning and thoughtful attention to a host of possible factors that if they're not addressed properly, will lead to poor results. Now, it's been long enough that I no longer remember the exact aha moment, but I do know that I made an important change in the laboratory instructions between the first time I taught to Chem 227 and the next time. And the inspiration for that change came from the conclusion of a prophet leader's message to his people in Mosiah chapter 4, verse 30. King Benjamin says, but this much I can tell you, that if you do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe the commandments of God and continue in faith, in the faith of what you have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even unto the end of your lives, ye must perish. And now, O man, remember and perish not. This scripture teaches us the gospel principle of careful use of our agency in making wise choices. We must be vigilant in the various ways in which it is possible to allow our discipleship to become sidetracked. As we remember this throughout life, we then proactively make wise choices that help us remain faithful. I considered how this gospel principle might help my Chem 227 students be more careful in the lab and thus become better scientists. So at the start of the semester for the very first assignment in the class, I added the following and discussed the implications for their laboratory work. But this much I can tell you, that if you do not watch yourselves and your titrations and your weighings and your pipettings and observe the instructions of this lab calibration handout, even until the end of this class, ye must fail. And now, O oh man, remember and fail not. Adapted from Mosiah 430, again, with apologies to King Benjamin. So understanding the principle of the wise use of agency in the context of laboratory work and the eventual consequence in the class can help students become better scientists. Students realize that if they want a good grade in Chem 227, they must prepare and use great care in the various processes of weighing and pipetting and titrating and so on. And also diligence and caution are not just necessary to do well on the first experiment. Careful technique throughout the entire semester is essential to obtaining a good grade at the end of the semester. This principle of the wise use of agency matters not only in Chem 227, where careful attention to laboratory technique is essential, but also even more so in life. Being watchful of one's thoughts, words, and deeds keeps us on the covenant path, but it must be more than a one-time adjustment. Careful watchfulness against sin, continued over time, helps to align our desires with God's as we choose to follow him instead of anyone or anything else. Now, if that outcome feels daunting, remember again the first principle that I talked about, that through repentance and Christ's atonement, we can gradually improve as we learn from our missteps. Changes in our long-term direction are not always perceptible in the near term, but sometimes when we look back, it is possible to see significant change or growth. Or as Sister Susan H. Porter said last month in General Conference, our past and present circumstances do not determine our future. I am especially grateful for this truth as it relates to my mission. One of the most widely talked about mission stories in our household is the hot dog fork. You see, I had a mission companion with a different dishwashing philosophy from mine. His approach was to wait until the clean dishes were all dirty before washing any dishes. Now, I'm more of a wash it after you use it kind of a guy. And so after some number of times of the dishes piling up in the sink and me not wanting to, make my turn, or not wanting to take my turn, I had the great idea not to develop charity, 
patience or another Christ-like attribute in dealing with the situation, or maybe even to have a conversation with my companion about how we should take care of the dishes, but instead to sequester one fork that I would use for all my cooking purposes. Problem solved. If there were no dishes left for making my lunch or breakfast or dinner, I could fork a hot dog, roast it over the propane hot plate, and enjoy a delightsome feast. Well, it, didn't take, it doesn't take a whole lot of hindsight to realize that this is not a key future determining characteristic for successful missionary service, or for that matter, even just being a, a member of the human community. So, thankfully, my missionary service was not determined just by this early stumble. And as one example, about a year later, one evening, my a companion and I were visiting a member of our branch. And at some point, we looked across the street and we saw there was a fire in a field with the flames advancing toward a small building. And so we raced across the street, quickly found a hose, hurried to the front of the fire, and were able to knock down the flames just before they reached the building. During the previous year of my missionary work, as I taught and served and learned to love the people of Argentina, I had lost some of that initial one-fork selfishness. So professionally, I have also seen how past and present circumstances do not determine the future. And a prominent example for me of this is in writing. I have not always been a confident writer or even a good writer. I got B's in English in high school. My senior year in high school, I took three AP tests, and I was really confident about two of them and, well, less so about the third one, AP English. When the letter came with my scores in the mail, and yes, this was in the days of real mail, uh, the summer before my freshman year at BYU, after I opened it, I was really happy about getting fives on two of the tests, but I was absolutely ecstatic about the three that I got for AP English. You see, a three was the minimum score to receive college credit, and this meant I wouldn't have to take freshman writing. And at that point, I thought I was done with writing. Now, if you're not already aware, Writing is an integral part of being a professor. Much of what I do involves writing, be it my own, from my students, evaluating others' writing, and so on. Confidence and ability in writing are foundational to success as a professor. Fortunately, I didn't need to have the writing skills of a professor when I started as a freshman at BYU. I was able to learn gradually and through a number of ways. One realization was that I had developed a fear of writing. I eventually decided to address that by taking an English class, and not just any course, but one on feminist literature. That class didn't teach me everything that I needed to know to be a better writer, but it gave me plenty of practice, and I also developed confidence in my writing abilities. I realized that I could write a lot better than I previously thought and I did much better in the class than I had initially expected. In fact, I got an A. Additionally, I received expert guidance from other BYU faculty members who helped me improve my writing as part of my mentored research. I also studied good writing, including scientific writing, by reading and trying to understand recently published papers. My doctoral and postdoctoral advisors further mentored me in my writing and gave me many opportunities to practice and improve my skills. Looking back, I can see three general processes that helped me improve as a writer. Number one, recognizing a deficiency. Number two, seeking expert help. And number three, practicing. Well, even now, I hesitate to say that I'm a good writer. I still have some imposter syndrome. However, I am really pleased with my writing accomplishments. My students and I have been able to publish more than 100 scientific papers, I've written research proposals that have resulted in funding that has supported dozens of students who've worked in my lab, and I'm even the chair editor for a peer-reviewed scientific journal where I get to decide whether or not hundreds of papers that are submitted every year are going to get published. I am profoundly glad that my future was not determined by the writing abilities of my past self. What I learned from becoming a better writer connects to the final gospel gospel principle I want to emphasize this morning, found in Ether chapter 12, verse 27. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. 
For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. If we are to let the Savior make weak things become strong, this verse states two prerequisites. We must develop humility and we must have faith in Christ. I note elements of commonality between these essential steps and the processes that I identified in my quest to become a better writer. I recognized a personal deficiency, in my case, fear of writing, and noting our weaknesses often occurs as we develop humility. I also sought expert, gui expert guidance, and as we develop faith in Christ, we pattern our life after the ultimate expert, the only perfect soul to live on this earth. Now, it's also very interesting that personal effort, my third observation about improving writing, also an essential element of these two previous eternal principles that I've discussed, personal effort is not mentioned in the process for having Christ make weak things become strong to us. And to me, this emphasizes the essential role of the Savior's grace rather than our own merits as he makes weak things become strong unto us. Allowing the Savior to make weak things become strong goes well beyond disciplined self-improvement plans that can help a person get better at something. Almost anyone can increase a particular ability through persistent, focused effort without invoking spiritual laws. And, you know, from my own experience, someone will likely become a better writer by identifying a deficiency, seeking expert assistance, and then practicing. However, the scriptural pathway for making weak things become strong is more than a self-help strategy or a way of developing talents in a profession. It involves letting God prevail in our lives and enlisting the Savior to make weak things become strong. It is the way to gain knowledge of eternal significance. It is how to create lasting change in our lives. What an amazing blessing it is that the Savior's atonement enables all weak things of any nature to become strong. Well, let's reflect on what I've discussed this morning. I've learned and grown professionally here at BYU in a, in a number of ways, through working with students who use 3D printing to develop improved microfluidic devices, by teaching introductory analytical chemistry, and in becoming a better writer. Those experiences have also provided me with useful life insights. First, the ability to improve through continued yet imperfect effort. Second, the need for careful attention to detail. And third, the possibility of becoming better than you currently are. The unique and synergistic environment of scholarship and faith at BYU has further connected those important life lessons to significant eternal truths regarding repentance and the atonement of Jesus Christ, the wise use of agency, and how Christ makes weak things become strong. I know that agency is a divine gift from God. I testify that through the atonement of the Savior, we can repent and have all our wrongs made right. He may make weak things become strong to us. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.